brought to you by Center for Public Policy Research, Kochi. I am Nisi Solomon, Senior Research Associate at CPPR Center for Competitive Uh CPPR is an independent public policy think tank based out in Kochi uh, since 2004, and our work mainly uh, covers public policy aspects of governance uh, and economy, urban studies, and uh, strategic studies. We also have uh, a training and development uh, development arm called CPPR Academy. So to know more about what we do, uh, do check out our website, uh, uh, cppr.in, uh, or our social media handle, uh, CPPR India, on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, I once again uh, extend a very warm welcome uh, to all the participants here. Uh, today we'll be discussing on the topic uh, Gulf migration in the COVID-19 setting. Uh, and I'm extremely uh, honored to introduce our panelists for the day. We have uh, Ambassador KP uh, Fabian. Uh, he uh, has served in uh, Indian Foreign Service from uh, 1964 to 2000. His last posting was in uh, Rome as ambassador to Italy. He is uh, also a permanent representative uh, to UN organizations, including FAO, uh, World Food Program, and IF80. Uh, even while in service, uh, Ambassador Fabian uh, wrote and spoke on international affairs, mainly at universities in Madagascar, uh, Austria, Iran, Canada, Finland, Qatar, and Italy. Uh, so we are really glad to have you here with us. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Gino Zakaria Uman. Uh, he is an academic and political activist based in Trivandrum. Uh, currently, he is also, uh, also a member of uh, Kerala Public Service Commission, uh, Trivandrum. Uh, prior to this, he was a visiting professor at uh, FMSH Paris. Uh, Dr. Uman has uh, held numerous fellowships and has uh, a visit uh, and has been a visiting faculty at reputed universities India and abroad. Um, to name a few, he has been um, a faculty at the University of uh, Poitiers, uh, uh, France. Uh, he's uh, uh, He's been a faculty at Gulf Studies program at JNU, uh, Indian Council for World Affairs, and um, Indian Center for Migration, to name a few. Um, his publications include South Asian Migration to Gulf Countries, History, Policies, and Development. He has also published Ethnicity, Marginality, and uh, Identity, the Jews of Putin um, in Israel. Uh, he has uh, published Asianization of uh, Migrant Workers in Gulf Countries. Um, and he has been conducting uh, extensive uh, field research um, in Israel, uh, Palestine, uh, France. Uh, so we're glad to have you uh, here for the session. Thank you. Uh, the session will be moderated by Dr. Uh, Martin Patrick. Uh, he is chief economist uh, of CPPR, and he's also a visiting fellow at Indian Maritime Institute at Abu, uh, and Vegas Institute of Management and Entrepreneurship. Uh, Dr. Martin Patrick secured his PhD in Applied Economics from Cochin University of Science and Technology, um, and he has uh, worked as faculty of economics in latest government uh, organization. He received his postdoctoral uh, training at Tilburg uh, University in Netherlands. He has uh, won an uh, award of excellence in, um, in education instituted by Global Society for Health and Education Group, New Delhi. Uh, he has completed various projects for ICSSR, um, CDS Planning Board of Kerala, uh, and the Gulati Institute. Uh, he has served as member of Graduate and Postgraduate Board of uh, Studies of Calicut University, Kwisat, uh, Kaledi University, and, uh, and Kerala University. Uh, so before we start the session, I would uh, like to uh, state some ground rules. Um, the discussion will be for about 35 to 40 minutes post which. The virtual floor will be open to discussion. You may type in uh, your questions in the chat box here and uh, in the Zoom, um, and we'll address the questions uh, to the speakers during the Q&A. Um, if you are coming through Facebook Live, you may uh, put your questions on the comment box, and our team will uh, coordinate with uh, it accordingly. Uh, requesting all the participants, except the speakers and moderators, to keep their audios muted. Um, and uh, you can follow our live tweets and uh, share your thoughts using the hashtag CPPR live webinars. Uh, in case uh, any of your friends could not join, do let them know that this uh, this session has been uh, live streamed on CPPR's uh, Facebook. Uh, thank you, and I now hand it over to uh, Dr. Martins. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nidia. Thank you for the nice words also. Okay, I'm uh, directly getting into the business because I don't want to to spoil your valuable time. 
Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to classify this presentation into three parts. The first is about the introductory remarks about the Gulf migration. The second is uh, relating to the issues of uh, returnees, returnees uh, from Gulf countries. Then the third is uh, something related to the policy aspects. So I'll be asking uh, one question each to the speakers, the great speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, straight away, I am asking the question because we want to listen to you, the participants. And we have to take up maximum number of questions from you. So the first question uh, goes to Dr. Uh, our ambassador and Professor K.P. Pabian. Uh, sir, um, uh, my question is, uh, you know that we all, all, all know that the top destination of Kerala in Kerala is really Gulf countries. Uh, there is a big problem. Always uh, uh, there is a lack of data relate, uh, relating to the exact magnitude of the workers uh, uh, or migrants working in the uh, countries or other parts of the world. But we have some statistics. One uh, prestigious work is done by Center for Development Studies under the label uh, Kerala Migration Survey. And we have some data uh, from the UN Migration Report 2019. As per the UN Migration Report 2019, the data is applicable to 2018. The total number of migrants in GCC, uh, Gulf countries, is 10.41 million. That is uh, something uh, related to the uh, magnitude of the immigrants in uh, GCC. So, however, uh, I don't want to uh, get into the magnitude of the migrant laborers in uh, Gulf countries and other parts of the world. So we know that uh, the top destination is Gulf region. So my question is that uh, for the last number of uh, years, uh, there has been a uh, dipping in the growth of the uh, migrants in the Gulf countries, number one. Uh, at, the, at the same time, we are saying that we are getting good amount of uh, money from these countries also. So I, I, I ask you, what is so unique about the Gulf migration? So, uh, thank you, Nisi, for that uh, very cordial introduction, which has mathematically demonstrated that I'm the youngest person attending this virtual meeting. <laughs> Since, uh, I started work in 1964. In fact, uh, some of the participants might have been even born after I retired in 2000. That's good. Now, uh, let me say good morning to all of you, including Participants from Warwick, uh, well, let me put it this way, very early good morning. Uh, now, among the institutions, I found uh, LSR Delhi, where I had gone recently, and also, of course, Christ College, Bangalore. But uh, uh, also, uh, among the public, uh, I hope uh, there are uh, some participants from the Gulf. Uh, well, if they are not there this time, let's hope that they will participate next time. And... Uh, before I answer the question posed to me, I just wanted to thank uh, CPPR for inviting me, especially um, Sri Dhanuraj. Uh, he and I come from the same village uh, with the Emperor. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to the question about uh, numbers, you know, we had started asking our community to register themselves with the Indian Embassy way back in 19, early 1990s. I was in uh, Doha, uh, let me get the, this thing right, in 92 to 97. We had then started uh, asking our community to do that. Um, well, some of them complied, others did not. Now, to my mind, this is a problem which can be easily resolved. After all, India is a highly IT-advanced country. So all that we have to do is to develop an app which uh, our people who are in the Gulf already and our people who are going there uh, for um, work, for migration, uh, 
should uh, activate when uh, they reach there uh, and that information can be uh, simultaneously given to the embassy concerned and also to MEA, Ministry of External Affairs uh, and perhaps even to the Ministry of Labor and it can be done but uh, I don't think it has been thought about and it has not been done. Another thing is that uh, our embassies in the Gulf, um, well, they are doing a good job, but uh, I feel that they can do a better job for which they need more resources, they need bigger buildings, they need more, uh, uh, more uh, officers. Now, somebody will tell us, uh, look, how can we spend more money? <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, our embassies in the Gulf are sending to External Affairs Ministry net remittances. Not only the Indian workers uh, in the Gulf, our embassies also are earning foreign exchange. Because you take the, our embassy in Saudi Arabia. You see, normally embassies get a monthly remittance uh, from MEA. But... Uh, um, the embassies in the Gulf do not need that remittance and uh, their consular revenue is uh, much in excess of their expenditure. So I don't see why we can't do that. And this should be done. Let me okay. stop here for the time being. So what is unique about the Gulf migration, sir? What is unique about the what Gulf is, migration? Okay, what is unique about the Gulf migration is that, you know, there was a time when people spoke of the Arabi Pona, that is the gold in Arabia, you know. So that was the sort of, you know, destination where, I mean, suppose somebody is a, an electrician here, say in Kerala, well, he might um, uh, gain, uh, say, X uh, uh, rupees uh, a month, but in the Gulf, uh, he can probably gain 3X or 4X and uh, he can send home much more money. That is uh, as regards that category. Then, of course, there are the other categories, doctors, uh, managers, uh, engineers, uh, uh, architects, and others. Now, for them also, what they can earn in Dubai is much more than what can most of them can earn in, say, Kochi or Tenevanandapuram. Let me give you a concrete example. My nephew, who is uh, having an IT office in Dubai, he told me that uh, he pays uh, his staff in Dubai per capita, twice what he pays in Kochi. He has an office in Kochi. Now, the fact of the matter is that the same Malayali from Kochi works in Dubai, according to my nephew, gives him twice uh, the yield. So, uh, in other words, he pays half X to the employee in Kochi and X to the employee in Dubai. And quite often, both are Malayalis. Though, as a matter of fact, he has got others also. So, uh, you know, that also is there. In other words, Malayalis work better outside Kerala. Okay. Okay, I, I will move to Dr. Jino Sakriya. In continuation of uh, uh, the remarks made by our ambassador KP for BN. I would like to ask because you have worked uh, on this area, particularly on the India Gulf relations. So, my question to you is uh, there is a connection, of course, between the Gulf countries and uh, Kerala. Uh, so, I am asking you will it be changed after the uh, COVID 19? Or uh, what would be the India Gulf relations after the COVID-19, will it be also positive for Kerala? That is a question. simple, straightforward question. Thank you very much, uh, CPPR and uh, Dhaniraj for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. And uh, I'm very privileged to be part of uh, my guru and my teacher, Dr. Professor Ambassador K.P. Fabian. He's also in the panel. I'm very happy to have him here. So in replying to your question, what is the future of the India-Gulf relations? I mean, India-Gulf relation is a strategic relation. There is nothing 
you know, no change is going to happen there because that is that will continue because remittances or migration per se is not the only component in the India Gulf migration because we largely depend on the Gulf for our energy security, for our oil, uh, for many for the trade, uh, for many other things. So, like any other country, it will continue. But as far as Kerala is concerned, that is where our issue is. Now the Gulf migration. Now please understand, and that's what I want to tell you even to the moderator. Our debate today, we should not confine to India and Kerala. The ambit of our debate in this particular topic has to be, we have to widen it up because South Asia Gulf Migratory Corridor is the largest corridor in the world. And around 17 million, that is rough, roughly, that's a rough estimate, 17 million uh, South Asian migrants from these five, six countries are working in the Gulf. And Kerala is only a part of it, number one. Number two, that is what where I want to, I want to, you know, to, 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 uh, to assert that this is part of an Asianization of migration in the Gulf. That is my latest work. You know why? Because they are not going to give, Gulf countries are not making us uh, some kind of a mercy or a help. Because this is a choice, this is a migration based on preference and choice. This is a preferred migration for the Gulf. Why? Because the South Asian migrants, particularly the Indian migrants are neutral. We are not politically aggressive. We are hardworking, submissive. These are some of the stereotypes which they have about the South Asian workforce, particularly about the Kerala and the Indians. They don't want the Gulf countries from the 60s and 70s, they have a post, taken a position. They are not going to invite the migrant workers from the Arab countries. For example, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, Lebanon. These countries, because they will come, they will make trade unions, they make associations, they will create a political problems there, number one. Number two, after the Iraqi Kuwait war, the withdrawal of the Yemenites and the Palestinian from the Gulf, that has given space, larger space for the South Asians and Southeast Asians and particularly Kerala's. For the post 90s, this is the trend today. So, but there is a change from 2000 onwards. What is that change? There is a vast availability of migrants today in the Gulf. They have options. The COVID-19 has brought a new terminology called disposable migrants. What is disposable migrants? That they can throw migrants anytime a new set of migrants will come. Therefore, as far as Kerala is concerned, so you directly your question, that your question is that the Kerala is highly depending on the Gulf and that might continue, I can't say a guarantee now. Post-COVID, what is the situation? In the grim economic situation, how many people are going to get the job? That is a million dollar question. One more point I want to add here. For the last 30 years, in the Gulf migration, there were three difficult phases. One was Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Second was the global economic crisis. The third was Nitakat. And all these spaces, somehow the migrant workers, even the Keralites were able to overcome. But the COVID-19, we are unable to say because there is a zero mobility at this moment. Boundaries have been tightened up. The private sectors are closing down. And therefore, the question of the future of the Gulf migration can be grim. And um, according to Professor Hridaya Rajan, who is an expert, he predicted yesterday that around 12 lakhs Indians might come back. So around 12 lakhs. What are the reasons? I'm going to stop now because we have other questions. So I will explain that further. Thank you. Okay. Okay, sir. I was very clear. Uh, in fact, I know well that our focus is the return migrants. Uh, as a part of the introductory remarks, I asked uh, this question to you. Now I move to uh, Professor K.P. Babian. Uh, in continuation of this uh, remark made by Dr. Janu Sakriya, uh, Professor K.P. Fabian, my question is, uh, is there any connection between the 91 crisis you faced in Iraq and the present crisis that you are going to witness in Gulf countries? 
uh, you can elaborate your uh, uh, views based on your experiences in Iraq as an ambassador. Okay. And at the same time, I would also ask you along with that, how do you evaluate the Vande Madhuram mission also? Professor KP Fabian. Fabian. Let me hear the first question once again, please. I got the one thing uh, uh, issue right. Uh, you were uh, heavily involved in the Iraq crisis uh, in sending our uh, Malayalis or Indians from there to our countries. Can you share your experience with that uh, okay. by comparing the present crisis in Gulf countries? Okay. Now, what that is the first part to... of my question. Thank you. Let me start with the first part. Uh, that was, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, that was, you know, you know, you know, on the 2nd of August 1990, I got a phone call. I was Joint Secretary Gulf. I got a phone call from a friend in Kuwait that Iraqi army has come in. And then, of course, uh, our first uh, thought was about our own people. What will happen to the community? And also, we wanted to avoid a war. So we tried our best. Foreign Minister Gujral went to New York and Washington, and uh, he came to the conclusion that Americans want a war. And therefore, we had to take the decision that our community had to be evacuated. Then we went to Iraq, we met Saddam Hussein. Poor Gujral was condemned for embracing Saddam Hussein, as though there was a choice. When the host is coming to come and embracing you, can you tell him, yeah, hey, don't touch me? So that was that. Then we arranged for uh, the Air India, through Air India, and uh, it went smoothly, though there were problems. But uh, only one problem, because of the time factor I want to mention, and that is that uh, I was once in Amman, and uh, the Air India manager told me I was having breakfast, same hotel, he was there. He said, sir, there is a big problem. The Air India staff walked out on me last night at 11 o'clock. Well, it was difficult for me to get the story right. But basically, the Air India staff waiting since 6 o'clock. They walked out at 11 o'clock after waiting for passengers who were late, not because of any fault of theirs. That's a different matter. We will not go into it. Anyway, he wanted me to talk to the, uh, the crew. I didn't, I didn't talk to them. And uh, I called uh, Firdaus Gargamwala, who was a Hindu correspondent in Bahrain. He was uh, in the foreign service earlier, but he got disenchanted. He went back to the Hindu. So I told him, listen, Firdaus, I want you to carry a story that Air India is doing a magnificent job. Passengers can come one hour late or seven hours late. Doesn't matter. Air India is always there with a smile, with a namaste. And then he asked me, is that true? I said, it's not true, but it will be true tomorrow if you carry the story. He hummed and hoed. Then I said, listen, you carry the story as from a senior joint secretary, nobody will find fault with you. So he carried the story. And the next day, the Air India manager came to me with a big smile. Sir, everything is OK. The crew says there will be never any problem. Why? Oh, there was a meeting of the association of the crew in Bombay and another of the guild of pilots in Bombay saying that there is media praise for Air India. So we have to earn the praise. So that is how it happened. So it helps to praise the people. Now coming to Vande Madhuram, my issue with that is that, you know, it should have been free for the workers because many workers, you know, they had not been paid for the last two months, three months. Now to expect them to pay for it was wrong. And uh, one solution would have been the community there. You know, our communities are very good. Uh, they could have organized it. And I spoke to uh, a community leader in uh, Qatar, and he told me that, well, we haven't thought about it, and uh, it's not all that easy. But uh, I think a clear decision should have been taken by the government that, well, our first preference is that the community takes care of it in, uh, uh, in cooperation with the embassy. But if there is still a backlog, then government of India will meet it. That was necessary. That was not done. But uh, let's see now uh, what happens. Okay. What about the Vande Madhuram mission now going on? 
Well, it is um, uh, successful partly, but uh, we still have a long way to go. I still get, uh, uh, you know, phone calls from people saying that, you know, look, they had uh, asked for a seat and uh, they are not getting it. In fact, uh, there was one case where a young lady, she was pregnant and in advanced stage and uh, she was not getting it. Then I spoke to the ambassador and she got it. But let me tell you one thing. When they register, our embassy doesn't give them a number, you know, because if there is a number, then they can phone up and ask. So I think there, should, there is need for a little more of transparency. And also, Kuwait and other countries had agreed to fly out our people on their own. So that also we could exploit it. But anyway, what I mean is that, you know, I don't want to speak too much about the past. Okay. Okay, well, Dr. Janu Sakriya, uh, I think you will be able to compare um, the Vande Madaram mission with the chartered flights also, or you can take it as a single thing and you can evaluate the Vande Madaram mission and the chartered flights, uh, uh, chartered flights program. Along with that, I am asking you one more question that uh, what is really the cost of this return migrants? Uh, particularly, you have uh, talked about the social mobility aspect of Kerala uh, after the uh, after uh, we went to uh, Gulf countries or uh, other parts of the world. This uh, social mobility aspect will it be affected adversely as a result of this return migrants? That is uh, uh, another part of my question. Okay, when you answer, uh, I expect that uh, you would uh, you would like to classify. The return of migrants into skilled laborers and unskilled laborers because i find some problems in the area of unskilled laborers um, which should be addressed properly okay sir dr dr patrick uh, what was the second question one day madhuram mission and chartered flights i got it what was the second second question it is a cost of uh, return of migrants cost of return of migration uh, are you following Yes, yes. Uh, the cost of return of migration and also the social mobility aspect. How would, would it be impacted? The social mobility aspect would be impacted because uh, under the cost aspect, you need not stick on with the uh, economic cost alone. The social cost should be taken into account. That when while you evaluate the economic cost, uh, definitely uh, try to uh, demarcate the issue of skilled laborers from that of uh, unskilled laborers. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. See, the first of all, one day Madhuram mission and chartered flights. Uh, what we are getting, Ambassador Fabian is the best expert on that because um, he's a retired IFS officer, very veteran uh, ambassador. So he has already answered. But let me tell you, this is uh, in the 1990s, what uh, Ambassador Fabian and the team, what they did was a repatriation, just free of cost. And they went, they checked, it was very difficult situation. There was no WhatsApp, no social media, no Facebook. It was the most difficult time the people like Fabian go. And not only that, I would like to uh, uh, also salute some of the businessmen who helped and who worked uh, tirelessly for the evacuation that time. And there is a movie has been made, it was called Airlift. That clearly shows what was the, 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 the vigor in which Ambassador Fabian and the other IFS officer did. And now, one day Madhuram Mission is a non scheduled flight where you have to pay. Now, what is the situation? Let me come. Let, I will, let, let us get you to the bottom of that. Yesterday, in the Kerala High Court, a writ petition was filed by the lawyers without borders, by the young lawyer called Subhash Chandra. What was the, what was the, uh, the plea? The plea was the net result of the COVID-19. What are the impact? Unemployment, underemployment, non-payment of salaries, non-payment of salary benefits, non-payment of retirement benefits. And even the people who died there during these three months were supposed to get compensation that have not been paid. South Asian workforce, which is the backbone of the Gulf economy, the last three months we are seeing they are knocking door to door, not for a basic requirement, even for the food. 
it is basically the pravasi organizations and the charity organizations are providing them the food so what really happened the private employees always taken as a pretext every crisis even in the 1990 crisis ambassador fabian may be to elaborate more the private construction companies or the manufacturing companies or the private employers they immediately terminate these employers they take it as a pretext they won't pay anything so what was the net result of this for last three months there was forceful eviction because they don't have money to pay the rent the second thing they don't have food they don't have even buy to buy a bathing soap so in this context how you expect a migrant to pay for this one day mother mission this is a big question that we are at, we are we are addressing even in kerala we are giving them kits food kits why because there is a lockdown migrant workers are unable to 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 do to do their daily work so we are providing them so one day madhuram mission in a way it's a non scheduled flight vulnerable communities have been accommodated there like pregnants like elderly and other things the real migrants are yet to come there are two reasons for that that is where the chartered flights are giving are doing a fantastic job i'm not saying that one day madhuram mission are not doing but chartered flights are flying free they are bringing these migrants free of cost please understand they don't have money to pay and bangladesh understood this real situation and what they are doing bangladesh they are giving the 5000 taka that is their currency on arrival and they are also giving 3 to 5 lakh rupees as a loan for for doing any kind of an employment or business and also the people who died there they are giving another 3 lakh so therefore what is the situation now is The, they are stranded they are a distressed migration they don't have money and they that the government should take care that ambassador fabian has said they are doing a, a, a good job but these at these certain points where the miseries of the migrants become doubled in the covid 19 so therefore that part we have to take care and how to evacuate them if professor rajan's prediction is correct there will be another 10 lakhs to come whether they have money to come that's a million dollar question at least kuwait government has declared amnesty through the amnesty the, the the travel of a migrant back home is free we are expecting that more countries are going to declare the amnesty that is the the first part of that the second part of that the socio economic mobility in kerala see the socio economic mobility from 1970s from the stagnation of kerala that got a major boost because of the remittances 90000 crores were the remittances that was remitted in kerala last year 80 billion was for india around 20 20 billion that the pakistan remitted 18 billion bangladesh 8.45 billion nepal another 5 billion sri lanka all together south asian countries remitted 140 billion according to the world bank there going to be a drop of 20% am i right professor fabian is it right they'll go yes yes 20% unfortunately you are right 20% fall is going to happen in the post covid situation now the real question is among that kerala government is facing now is that how to cope up with the situation because there is going to be a zero mobility the gulf countries the their future and also the economic situation is going to be grim now there are two things yesterday i gave in a interview in a fm radio in dubai so i mentioned only these things the gulf traveling to gulf is a dream gulf is an illusion for many because you know arabi pundit that's what exactly fabian has mentioned it's an illusion and a dream and i don't think there is a great difference between the wages and the benefits what a bengali and a bihari is earning in kerala and what a keralaite is earning in the gulf at this present context there is not a much difference therefore the kerala government have to think now kerala government has declared a dream initiative project to integrate now what is the three mantras of the before us origin countries resettlement reintegration and rehabilitation of the migrants cash transfer that professor rajan and others are advocating but i am advocating 
as a successful successful reintegration of these migrants. For example, a plumber or a carpenter from a village, a Mahavilikara, has gone to Gulf. In that place, a Bihari or a Bengali or Azami has taken over. Now, in the COVID situation, these internal migrants have left Kerala. Now, there is a vast space of employment now is vacant. The question is how to utilize the skills of these migrants. Maximum utilization of the skills and resources of the migrants in the most constructive way. That should be the policy. Because the Gulf is a technologically advanced state. The work uh, environment is different. The technology is different. So they are coming with, a, 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 how to say, a large amount of skills and resources and experience. And the state government should be able to tap that. That is my suggestion. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, there is uh, some social bottlenecks to accept the jobs in our uh, local places as far as the uh, return migrants are concerned. This is a big bottleneck for them. So is it possible for uh, us to rehabilitate them easily in the places where the um, interstate migrants left that job? Is See, it possible? That, that is precisely, Dr. Patrick, you made the point. The point is in Malayalam, we say Duravimanam, right? To take any kind of a job. There is, there is some kind of an inhibition within the Malayali to do or take up job within the Kerala, but they, are, they don't have a problem to do in Coimbatore. They don't have a problem to do in Chennai exactly. or, or in Gulf. That is the real issue. That, work, that dignity of labor. See, Kerala is a very egalitarian society. Kerala is in all ways a very progressive society. And Kerala has evolved for the last 100 years in a different way. We have, renaissance, we have renaissance movement, reform movement. We have broken the shackles of caste and patriarchy. But in the workplace, that taboo is still there. That we have to break. What is that taboo? That social taboo even today. But that's why. That I will give you the example. That I will that give you the, 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 the suggestion. That is, when you come back to UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, even Bangladesh, even Tamil Nadu, the migrants who have gone to Gulf, their educational qualification, if you, if you compare, they'll be less than 10th class or 10th class or 8th class or, you know, they are less than higher secondary. But according to the CDS, that is the main point. That is nobody is mentioning that. According to the CDS, the average education of a Kerala migrant in the Gulf is plus two. They have completed the higher secondary before going to Gulf. Many of them have completed graduation. Many of them have completed the technical course. So with this education in his hand, it is a difficult. Socially, it is a problem for him to work within his village. That taboo has to be changed. How to be changed? Government is coming with some suggestions that we can have a cooperative of a pool of you know different different technicians, technocrats, carpenters, even for the other jobs. We can have a pool of certain cooperative or some kind of a company can be registered, like in the like in all over the world, like in the best. So you register your so if suppose if I want a, some electrician, we should uh, you know enter that site, ask for the electrician, a proper way should be paid, and it should be in a dignified way that the employee and employer should behave. I think these things will evolve. Why it should evolve? Because the bridges have been burned. There is no other way a migrant can go back to any other countries. All over, it is difficult. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Janu Sakriya. I know that the participants will have a number of questions at this stage. But we enter the last part of the presentation. The last part is related to the policy aspect. After that, you can ask questions. So my question goes to our ambassador and Professor K.P. Fabian. Uh, my question to you, sir, what are the lessons to the national politicians from this return of migration uh, from Gulf countries and also your experience elsewhere? Uh, I also have a uh, question along with this. Uh, already there is a um, saying that there will be a change in the economic order after the COVID-19, there is a saying that China will be the superpower or something like that. Do you expect that there will be a change in the 
world economic order if so what would be its impact on kerala okay let me start with the second question first that is okay. about the world economic order <laughs> um, you said after the covid we are still in the covid phase eh? let's hope that we will get out of it soon um, first thing i want to say is that uh, you know political scientists speak of political order economic order and all that but in the real world there is a lot of disorder <laughs> more disorder than order <laughs> now uh, as far as uh, the covid situation is concerned china is comparatively in a better position in the sense that uh, they have gone through it and well there has been another uh, sort of uh, set of infections but uh, hopefully they will you know take care of it so that way they are better off but uh, at the same time china has uh, uh, by various actions spoiled its relations with the rest of the world china has spoiled uh, uh, its uh, good reputation by being difficult with india at the border china has spoiled its relations by getting tough on on hong kong and whatever be china's role or president uh, trump's role china uh, us relations are at a very low ebb and even the european union you know uh, has become very what shall i say circumspect about china because they are saying that china will buy up companies which are in distress and the european union has taken the decision that look we have to keep an eye and we cannot permit such uh, uh, purchases of companies just like that so in other words while on the one hand china will be in a better position to resurrect its economy after the covid but on the other hand china's relations with the rest of the world have are not in a good shape so it cuts both ways so i don't expect uh, uh, china to gain so much you know economically there will be pluses and minuses now coming to the first question what have our uh, political leaders learned what are the lessons they should learn well i am sorry to say it appears and i shall be glad to be proved wrong they haven't learned many <laughs> lessons <laughs> uh, though i should say that the state of kerala has handled it uh, much better than other states what i would suggest is that the government of kerala should right now uh, set up a team you know in the case of covid don't forget uh, the first infection was on the 31st of uh, january uh, you know when but uh, by the time uh, the kerala state had already uh, appointed a high power committee you know the state minister of health uh, had taken the initiative so i would suggest that in this case uh, uh you know a, a figure of 10 lakhs was mentioned uh, that may happen or may not happen but let us be clear in our mind that there is a re huge reverse migration happening and we have to be prepared for that and the best thing is for the government of kerala to have a um, a team of experts from the government and outside the government especially center for development studies and others you know to put together to find out what is happening you know in the gulf not only covid but uh, because of uh, uh, you know the uh, decline in the price of oil and gas you know the gulf economies are not ship shape they so and the covid has only aggravated the problem so i think we have to apply our mind and study it and be prepared and uh, it's not easy it's not going to be easy as professor gino gino mentioned it's not going to be easy but you know there is nothing which we cannot face and handle if we are uh, go about it in a uh, methodical manner uh, sir will there be any new destination for our keralites like a gulf countries or <laughs> any other new destinations well you know according to the ilo the number of people finding employment uh, outside their country that number is not going up mm. you know? yes that number is uh, going down 
so we'll have to wait uh, we'll have to wait people say that african countries are viewed as a new destination for uh, uh, people in india yeah uh, what do you can, think about this no we can do that provided our big companies get active there because some african yeah. countries are giving you land le yes. long lease for uh, agriculture and the china has taken over yes yes i don't know about indian companies maybe they have taken over but we can do that uh, if our big companies uh, get the act together uh, don't forget we have a huge africa fund i don't think it is put to the best possible use so africa can be a destination but it will be a different destination you know what i mean okay i am moving to jinnu sakriya the last question after that participants please be ready Uh, Dr. Jinu Sakriya, do you think that there is a need for migration policy, or the change in the migration policy in this uh, new context? Um, okay, number one. Uh, number two is uh, we have a new project, uh, what is called the rehabilitation for the returnees, under the name the uh, Dreams Kerala. how do you evaluate that do you think that there should be some change especially uh, in line with uh, your earlier remarks you have made some suggestions for uh, rehabilitating the returnees in the yes. uh, local workplace in this context uh, let me ask you whether the dream kerala is the right project do you think that uh, there should be some change in that project please answer Yeah, yeah thank you sir see actually the my, we don't have a migration policy and india is the largest migrant sending country 17 million migrants are working all over the world the the the, the unfortunately we have yet to formulate a migration policy so far number 1 number 2 at this moment the need of the hour is a comprehensive migrant governance management system that not only for india even for both host and home countries have to come together sit together and to create a comprehensive migrant strategy package we have to think about it unfortunately the reason ilo convention there are a number of ilo conventions un conventions regarding to the migrants ilo convention on the protection of the migrant and migrant families which came to effect in 2003 none of the gulf countries have signed i think only sri lanka has signed so far there is a global compact for safe migration that was that resolution was passed as a un non binding resolution was passed even india is a signatory to it nothing has happened much more an experienced uh, ifs officer is here dr fabian he will be able to tell you there are humpty number of multilateral bilateral agreements in papers nothing there is there is not there is no use of that and ultimately when it come to the ground there is nothing you know why i am saying this let me tell you an example for that according to the bilateral agreements that the employer in the gulf countries have to sign with the employee a full insurance that is their medical protection and the covid 19 has exposed something remarkable what was that in when there was a complete lockdown when the flights were stopped flying between the borders then there was absolutely there was panic then if you remember in the month of march in the tv channels when there was a discussion these representative of the migrant workers and the pravasis were asking not for food not for repatriation not for water they were asking for basic medicines that is lifestyle medicines diseases medicine lifestyle diseases what are the lifestyle diseases cholesterol diabetes blood pressure even kidney liver these issues then the world the policy maker makers the politicians came to know that the migrants are carrying these medicines from home from the from their home countries 3 to 4 months of medicines they carry or sometimes once it is over they will ask their friends to bring it up then what what does it mean so it shows that even a basic medicine they are unable to buy in the gulf so they were asking kerala government to send these basic medicines so my my fundamental question is even all these policies 
and all these bilateral agreements, all these even all are false. It's a fallacy of the medical protection which has been. So we need to have a proper migration policy, a migrant management system, and govern system. That is the need of the hour. Number one. Now the Dream Kerala project. Now Ambassador Fabian has, has narrated it very clearly. What is the, this is this is not uh, this is an unprecedented situation. Because we never had this kind of a situation before. The Thakat, yes, few people were, they, they had come. We did something. But what is the need of the hour is that policymakers, bureaucrats, even the leaders, they have to sit together. We have to formulate how to rehabilitate them. 1990, our experience. I, have, I, I did my field research in Kuwait. I have interviewed the people who have witnessed the war, who came and then returned back. What is... They told me that during the interview that the nurses, paramedic, technicians, technocrats, all of them started, they joined small jobs, whatever, whatever was available in Kerala. They went to neighboring states and they have, you know, they started, they didn't sit back at home. They didn't wait for the government. At that time, we never had a North, we never had Norca. We never had this kind, these uh, government policies. So they did, they, they went and took up job of their own. Now the situation has changed. Now the government has to think. Now there are three things, uh, three different categories I will categorize these migrants. Number one is unskilled, which I said there should be an app, there should be, you should think about it. In a, and also there are professionals who are coming. See, there is salary cuts and retrenchment in the Gulf. It's not only for the semi-skilled, low-skilled migrants, even for, a, even for professionals, IT professionals, High tech professionals, the people who are working in travel agencies, people who are working in the companies. I know many of my friends, they got the notice that their salary will be reduced to 30% from last month. So how you are going to accommodate them? See, it's very difficult. We are, we are talking about only about the unskilled, semi-skilled one. Even what about the professional? Maybe some doctors will come. Maybe some IT professionals will come. So how you are going to accommodate that? That is a, 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 a larger question that the government have to sit together. That's what government said, Dream Kerala Initiative. When the chief minister announced that, he said, we are waiting forward for suggestions from the public. Now the people have to suggest. And the migrants from their experience have to suggest. Policy makers have to suggest. Then a committee will be set up by hopefully soon. And then they have to evaluate. They have to formulate a rehabilitation policy soon. OK, thank you. Hello. Uh, unlike the normal programs, uh, we followed a conversation type of uh, uh, presentation, a question and answer session. Now the participants can ask question. Uh, Nadia, uh, you have to um, ask the questions. Yes, sir. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, this one um, is Please partly... Louder. Yes, uh, we have one question uh, from Siddharth uh, Shankar uh, Srinivas. Uh, although this question is partly uh, answered by Jinu sir, uh, he, uh, he wants to know and understand the exact breakup of uh, blue collar and white collar workers among Malayali migrants in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, uh, further to this, he has, been, uh, he has asked uh, if uh, the state can support the influx um, of uh, migrants without considerable uh, central aid, especially considering the uh, financial health of the state. The state had additionally introduced some uh, key assistance and uh, uh, programs for MSMEs. So what can uh, additionally be done? Uh, should the state actively encourage and facilitate internal migration for white collar workers? So I can I, I think that uh, Dr. Jinu can answer this question. No, tell me one thing. I didn't get. Just tell me very clear. You didn't get. Uh, please repeat the question, Nidia. Once again. First one, I I got the data of blue collar, white collar job. That I got it. What was the second yeah, question? Yeah. yeah, the second question is uh, on uh, how the state can support the influx without considering, uh, you know, a considerable central aid, uh, especially mm. considering the. Uh, financial he health of the state. I think uh, he means the state. Uh, oh, states, respective finance. states, whether can do. Okay. The financial I, health got it, I, I got it, sir. So it's a blue collar, white collar job. As Ambassador mentioned, you know, we, let me put it very frankly. We don't have another big data or, of migrants so far. CDS have, of course, they have a migration survey for last three or seven migration survey they had. 
and the government of India, MEA has a, has a separate uh, data, and um, also the UN or World Bank has some data. But well, I don't believe in this data, but I can tell you that's around 70 percent to 75 percent are blue collar. The vast majority of the South Asian workforce, not only Kerala, South Asian workforce are low skilled, semi skilled workers. Number one, white collar jobs. It started from 50s. Don't remember that it started from 70s. Even during the British mandate, the Indians were the preferred migrants. So even there were paramedic, even the, the male nurses who were in the, in the army, they used to go and work in the British hospitals there. The post in the, in the British post office, in all these British offices in Dubai, in Kuwait, the Malaya, particularly Malayalis used to go there, number one point. Number second, the white collar jobs, basically the medical professionals, paramedic, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists. Of course, this is a lot. This is a, uh, around the five to ten percent chunk. And the post 19, what we have the migration of professionals, IT professionals. So therefore, our 20 to 25 to maximum 30 will be this skilled white collar, all of them put together. But the rest 70 percent will be definitely is low skilled, semi skilled workers. I also give an because in, in Bangladesh, there are around 10 million, their total uh, migrant strength is 10 million, roughly. Out of that, around 4.75 million out of the Gulf. But they are remitting, they are remitting only 18.5 billion as remittances 2019. You know why? Because vast majority of the Bangladeshi migrants are okay. low skilled. And they are low skilled, they are semi skilled. They are just gone there to work because there's, complete, there's a complete unemployment and underdevelopment in that country. So they, they have gone there. So therefore, the, uh, the data, what Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Fabian said, that we need, to we need to evolve certain authentic data as regards Gulf is concerned. And second, state and central aid. See, well, the government has announced some uh, certain uh, amount during the COVID time, but the problem, the real issue is no specific package for the migrants have been announced by the central government. There is no specific package. If you look at Sri Lanka, if you look at Pakistan and other five countries, only Bangladesh have come out with a package so far. In the South Asian countries, Gulf migrants per se, no countries have announced a package for them so far. Maybe tomorrow or maybe next day there will be an announcement. So far, there is nothing. Without a central aid, whether we can rehabilitate these migrants, not possible. It is not okay. possible. You know why I'm making a distinction here? I, I just quickly make that, I, I mentioned that. See, these people, the vast amount of migrants went to Gulf because there is unemployment. Because there is no employment, there is no employment opportunities. That was the time when GDP was doing good, pre-COVID pre time. In, you know, when in 2000, 2004, 2005, 2006. Now, it's a crisis period. Now the real challenge is in this crisis, economically grim period, where we are going to give employment for these returning migrants. It's a million dollar question. So we really need to think and to formulate, to accommodate. I'm saying not only unskilled or semi-skilled, all categories of migrants. Okay, Nidhya, next question, please. Yes, sir. We have uh, a question from Sana. Um, uh, she has asked, uh, why has the Gulf migration witnessed a dip in the last couple of uh, years as compared to a couple of decades back when uh, Gulf countries were the hotspots uh, for migration? Uh, do you have any other questions to add along with this? Yeah, and uh, further she has asked, what should be the stand of policy makers with uh, regard to internally displaced uh, migraine, will it be possible for Gulf returnees to fill the void created by internal migrants that have left the state for their home state? This is to Professor me. Fabian? Fabian. Professor Fabian can answer. Uh, it's a question relating to the dipping in the growth rate of the migrants in Gulf countries. Okay. Uh, you know, there is something called uh, uh, with apologies, there is something called the economist 
fallacy. Hmm. That is linear extrapolation from the past. Since uh, there has been positive growth in the migration to the Gulf for the last so many years, we naturally assume that growth will continue forever. Now that's a fallacy. We have no reason to, uh, you know, come to that conclusion. Now, in the present case, uh, even before the COVID crisis, the migration to the uh, Gulf has been coming down for various reasons. I shall spell out only one or two. One is the difficulties which their economies have been experiencing because of the fall in oil and gas prices. Second is local unemployment, that is young Arabs not getting the job. So Nikakat and all that, you know, Omanization, Saudiization and all that. And the third is that uh, they have, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Ah, the yes. third is that uh, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, construction, buildings, bridges, roads. Now, that phase is almost getting over, so they don't need more big buildings, more long road, longer roads and bridges and all that. I'm not saying that there is no absolute need, but I'm saying that that need is uh, coming down and in some cases has come down. And only to sort of, you know, uh, maintain what is built. Now, this afternoon I'll be talking to the eng our engineers in Doha. The Association of Indian Engineers, uh, well, they have 2,000 members. Now, I am told by the chairman that about 10% of them have lost jobs. As uh, Professor Ginu mentioned, you know, there has been, you know, uh, cutting off of salaries and all that. But then I was told, you know, that, uh, well, this 10%, uh, say 200. And uh, they will look around for other jobs at a lower salary and still continue there maybe for one more year before they decide to come back to India. So there are these reasons and we have to understand that uh, these are the basic reasons why uh, uh, the Gulf does not need more migrants. Okay. And one more point I want to make. Uh, Professor Ginu correctly mentioned that 70 to 75 percent are skilled and, um, you know, sorry, semi-skilled and uh, unskilled. Yeah, that's right. In fact, uh, you know, mainly household drivers and all that. But at the same time, let's be realistic. Uh, I mean, uh, a country has, uh, uh, say, two th needs 2,000 engineers from India. Obviously, it, it uh, needs uh, many more uh, maids and drivers, uh, you know what I mean. It doesn't need, uh, you know, uh, suppose it needs uh, 10,000 maids. It doesn't need 10,000 engineers or managers, you know. So there is a, you know, Logic. Uh, composition of the need, you know, of the, of the, uh, of the Gulf uh, economies, of the Gulf societies. And one more thing, uh, the need for the so-called household, that includes not only baby care, cooking, but also nursing, because you know there is a growing number of people who are getting old, and also now women are also girl women are taking up jobs, so they need people for child care. So what I would call skilled home care. Now that category, I'm told, you know, the need there will not come down, and the need there will go up. So we also have to apply our mind in what way we can fill up that need. How do we train our people? How do we get into it? Because when I was in government, the government of India had taken the decision that uh, if you are a woman, then if you are less than 30 years, and if you don't have qualifications beyond a level, then you need uh, immigration clearance and all that. Well, that was necessary up to a point. But then, you know, our own people were smart enough. They will go to Sri Lanka, on a uh, on a tourist visa and from Sri Lanka they will take a visa and go to Kuwait you know so we have to study the opportunities there and see how best we can handle it and let me also make one more point the Filipino embassy for example when a maid reaches uh, the Gulf country 
they keep the maid for two days uh, in a place, uh, give her an introduction to the country, and also tell her, you know, this is how you should behave, teach her a little Arabic and this and that. So that is also something which we can think of. Okay, Nidhya, next question. Uh, so this question is directed to uh, Dr. Rumin. Uh, do you think uh, Kerala should give give up high hopes or uh, give high hopes to returning migrants for their rehabilitation? Uh, because uh, most of them are semi-skilled and fairly paid until yesterday. So do you think Kerala has that much space existing here? This question is asked by Roy John, um, Consul Management. I think uh, we have answered this question. Yeah, um, already answered. I have, uh, yeah, take the second other answer. Take other questions. Okay, so uh, there's another question from Casey Abraham, sir. He is uh, academic director of CPPR. Uh, why doesn't the government make it mandatory for uh, the migrant workers to register their needs before they go, and so the public authorities can have data in their uh, policy formulation? It's to me. It's um, a question to be answered by bureaucrats. Still, uh, uh, Dr. Jinu, can you answer? No, let uh, 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 Dr. Ambassador Fabian respond, then I'll respond. Okay. Okay. I, as Joint Secretary Gulf, I had tried to initiate a procedure where the our people, and you know, I mean, my focus was on uh, the skilled and the semi-skilled, you know, because, you know, we can leave alone the doctors and engineers. They can look after themselves. It is uh, this category, these categories that need our help. So I had tried to initiate a scheme where uh, uh, the maid, for example, should be able to um, contact the embassy. And what I had said is, since she may have problems, the recruiting agency in India, you know, in Tirunelveli or anywhere else, should send to the Indian embassy a photocopy of the passport of the maid and details of her employer and the phone number and all that you know so that the embassy will have a record and i had also said that she should have with her a photocopy of her passport and other details including the details for the embassy you know and the phone number and all that because the practice then was and uh, probably now also is that as soon as the employee comes, the employer takes away the passport, mm -hmm. you know? So it was necessary for the employee to have a copy of the passport. Now, these things I tried, but I don't think uh, I succeeded, but they can be done and they should be done. With the IT that we have, it's much easier to do that. Next. Um, yes, sir. so this is again directed to uh, Dr. Luna. Uh, historically, we have seen there has been a connect between uh, subcontinent and the Arab world. As, uh, as can you be can you be louder? I can't hear. Uh, yes, so uh, this is uh, something that you argued in your uh, book that there has been uh, you know a historical connect between uh, the Arab world and the subcontinent. So. Uh, this is also largely helped in uh, migration as well. So do you think the situation is going to change given the situation now? So we have yeah, really I, answered I, this question, but maybe still. I can, maybe I can, maybe I can, so yeah. I can, this is a confusion actually that I think that I, there should be some clarity. See, historical linkage, trade relations and civilizational links between the West Asia and India, that is a known fact that were trade there was spice trade between Malabar and Kerala and all, all those things. But migration, these people, these things have contributed in the flow of migration. But the real issue is, the real issue is the Indians, the South Asians and the Southeast Asians are outcome of preference and choice. I want to reiterate that point again. Because we are not, we as South Asians, we are not going to create any political disturbance in the Gulf. Indians were preferred in the oil and gas installments in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait than Pakistanis. That is the, the trust. Therefore, that will continue. But the problem is there are two issues when we talk about the Gulf migration. Gulf migration has
a migrant now we talk about remittances we talk we talk about migration the gulf migrant the migrants per se don't have any basic rights labor rights not issue. there is no kind of redressal grievance redressal system it is an exploitative kafala controlled system and during the covid 19 the miseries of the migrants become more because of this kafala so therefore the relationship between kerala historical links all fine but as far as the migration labor rights as far as the migrants life is concerned this system there should be modification and there should be a larger thinking about this exploited nature of the gulf migrants so our okay. next questions have been uh, you know answered in the talk given uh, if there is anything other than uh, what was mentioned already in the talk you can uh, shoot the question we can take few more yeah if there is anything new yes. not clear not clear um so there is one uh, question uh, which uh, is uh, asked by tees and tj will the return of migrants have any possibility of empowerment of agricultural startups in kerala okay uh, a, a, again dr jino you can answer that whether the return of uh, migrants will help to boost the development of agriculture sector see there is uh, see kerala as such we are depending highly on tamil nadu for our vegetable supply that is a non fact now in the covid uh, once the covid the issue erupted we have started what is called self sustained agricultural Uh, a system that is called subiksha kerala and many other projects where now we can see hundreds of people are getting into into cultivation into agriculture productions all these things are happening well there is definitely there is a scope what is our i think the agriculture ministry's main hope is when there was a lockdown when the borders were closed between tamil nadu and Karna, between tamil nadu and kerala and with the karnataka borders closed we had real shortage now to overcome that whether we can whether the the people can be encouraged to get into the agriculture which was the backbone of us 20 to 30 years before even my own household even in kerala i born in a place called chengannu i mean going to market was once in two weeks because everything was available at home It, you know there is no need to go and buy these things but now the situation has changed we are getting back to that culture and definitely definitely and uh, these uh, migrants can be a part of it but again as uh, master fabian said about this rehabilitation policies category wise there should be there need a larger discussion there should be a brainstorming session then the government have to come out the government is started it so i myself not in a position to answer all these things there are certain suggestions you know that i i'm i'm making now um yes yeah. um so uh, this is from abraham sir do you think uh, don't you think it's a uh, high time that the country make economic policy that uh, generates job for its people than forcing them out of jobs is to me uh, for fabian for fabian job generation i can i think uh, uh, professor fabian can answer this well um the question is well taken we should certainly make sure that uh, our people can find job uh, within uh, india itself but uh, let's also face it you know we are living in an increasingly globalized world yes and uh, considering the population of india i think it will be necessary for india to indians to seek employment uh, elsewhere also but that we should uh, uh, increase employment within india is a point very well taken So, uh, so uh, we have uh, yes. answered almost all the questions. So, over, uh, are over. Okay. Okay. Then I can conclude. I think. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I, I have a question to both of them regarding this uh, Islamic forces in Gulf region, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Jinu in his book uh, referred to some of these. Uh, developments in the region uh, since 1980s there has been this islamic you know uh, forces i would say islamophobia uh, for good or bad reasons 
so uh, we also know that uh, we have some 23 ICs uh, recruitees from Kerala. Uh, when uh, you know the state intelligence and central intelligence had conducted uh, uh, raids and uh, they had even interrogated them, but some of them had returned back also. So you think the present situation? Uh, uh, the Gulf migration and uh, I think the Kerala because of the social fabric and also because of the close connection to the Gulf region, uh, we were able to save uh, our population from uh, the ICs and everything. Do uh, you think that once this disconnect happens, once uh, there is a grid picture on migration to Gulf countries, do you think uh, we will also come under the influence of Islamic forces, normal terrorist forces? You are asking me, Dhanraj? Yes, what of you could answer from your experience? Ambassador Fabian, then I answer. Well, let me get the question right. The question is whether, because of what is happening now, uh, there will be any reduction in the likely number of young people who might be misguided and go and join the Islamic State. Is that the question? Is it reduction or will we see more people join? Okay. Yeah, I said uh, reduction or uh, absolute uh, end. Now, I don't think uh, we can say anything about it because these young people have been misguided for reasons nothing to do with uh, uh, the migration or employment opportunities uh, in the Gulf. They have been misguided because of, uh, mainly because of internet propaganda where these Islamic State uh, war, uh, propaganda was able to convince them that here is a new, what I say, utopia, you know, an ideal uh, utopia being uh, constructed, and young people should come and sort of be part of that. Now, that uh, I'm afraid might go on. All that we can do is to educate our own young people. And thank God that Islamic State is territorially extinguished, but not fully. It is extinguished only in Iraq, uh, Syria. It is elsewhere. You know, uh, for example, in Yemen, it's there. And elsewhere also, even in Libya. So, uh, but even more than territorially, the Islamic State is there in the virtual world. And uh, that, I think, uh, education of the youngsters that has to continue. And uh, when I say education, it also means change in policies. Because if any government does anything which gives the impression, meant or not meant, that there is Islamophobia with that government's policy, then that will be indirectly benefiting the Islamic State. So we need strong secular policies so that People who want to mislead our youngsters do not get a chance to do that. Okay. Can I, uh, Dr. Jiju, can I, can I change uh, that? Uh, I mean, can I modify the question a little bit? Yes. What I learned from some scholars is because of this uh, huge uh, population there, you know, our people were not wrapped into the Islamophobia. So my question was, when we come back, start coming back, there is a number, the reduction number of migrants staying back there. So will it lead to more, you know, uh, get, we will be forced to or they will be enticed by this uh, uh, philosophy there. That's, that was my question. Well, uh, say, la say the last part again. Yes, yes. Now, will they be enticed by this philosophy? Uh, because more and more people are coming back, so only few are going to stay back there. So do you see a challenge there in terms of, uh, you know, saving them from getting into that trap? See, there is. Um, um, we should look at look this um, aspect into a larger level. That is, that is. We talk about remittances, but there is an another terminology or a concept that is developed by American sociologists called social remittances. Mm -hmm. Social remittances are ideas, practices, traditions, religion, all this which is flowing from home state to host and host to home because Gulf migration is both transitory and circulatory in nature. It, they are going for a shorter period of time and then it circulates. You know, then there is a, around 3 lakhs will be going this year. 
another two lakhs will be coming. So it always circulates. Now, the impact of transnational migration on religion is not only applicable to Islam. That is my study. It is applicable to all the three religion. The, the, the migration and remittances have changed the traditional nature of Kerala and brought into new spirituality and new elements in all the three religion, including Hinduism, Christianity and Islam. For example, Christianity, my paper is available in the net. All these charismatic uh, conventions, God, all these pastors, all kind of uh, you know new generation churches, it is direct impact of the migration and the remittances. If you look at the followers of many of the pastors or many of the preachers, a 60 to 70 percent will be from the Gulf. And also there is a commodification of rituals. There is a commercialization of rituals. What we see in Christianity is a commercial Christianity. In Hinduism, there is a commodification of rituals, both in Hinduism, in Christianity, and in Islam. Number one, that is the point. So don't confine this uh, 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 change of religion only to Islam. That one. Number two, number two, how you then substantiate the recruits that have gone to Afghanistan? They have nothing to do with Gulf migration. There is a there is an article, recent article of uh, ISI wives, basically Malayali girls who are in Kabul. There is an there is an article on that. So how are how are you going to substantiate that? Not at all. That is that is not a valid argument. Number number three, see the the prosperity of Malapuram, Kannur, and the Kasaragod districts is because of the Gulf migration remittances. Don't forget about that. There is a direct you know, uh, 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 contribution of the remittances in the most positive way. They have been, it, there's a, a complete overall development in these countries if you look at this Islam. So, this ISI is, this uh, fundamentalism is an aberration. As Ambassador Fabian said, that all the religion, not only Islam, why to point out only Islam, all the three religions had to be educated properly in Kerala because a new version of a fundamentalism we can see in Kerala. That is not only applicable to one religion, where remittances played a major role in this. Because what are the what are the areas in which a migrant is investing money? That please look at it. Number one in Kerala health. Number two education. They invest a large amount of money. Number three is construction and real estate. From the from the from the 2000 or maybe a little back onwards, there is a trend. Large amount of money are going investing in the religious space. Local parish or a local temple or a local mosque is becoming a jury to assess the socio-economic progress of a migrant. A migrant in Gulf is not getting the status what he is get, what he is expecting. That he is getting in his local parish. That is where the huge invest of investment of money in these religious organizations. So it's a larger question, social remittances, transnational migrations, and new dimensions dimensions of religion in Kerala. That has to be studied thoroughly. Okay. Danu, can uh, I control? Uh, then, uh, my comment on that. So you, are you going to, are you saying uh, there's a double whammy, uh, COVID-19, because it actually locked down all the religious Say again. Say again. So there is a double whammy in terms of, you know, there is a lockdown and we have locked down the religious institutions for such a long time, unprecedentedly. And second is, you are also saying there is a problem, there is a reduction in remittance in the coming uh, uh, coming months. So this could be uh, probably there will be an existential crisis for the religious institutions. In the country. Yes, in the definitely, country. remittances are the backbone of the religious institutions in Kerala. There is no doubt about it. And this reduction of remittances will affect all the areas, all the fields in Kerala as far as concerned. One will be religious institution. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, let me conclude. Okay. Uh, so it, it was really a wonderful session uh, covering the various aspects and issues of the return migrants from Gulf countries. We have covered almost all aspects relating to this problem, and we have answered almost all questions raised by our participants. Now, I know well that. Uh,
a problem uh, for Kerala in the coming years. In fact, this problem uh, started in Kerala even before the COVID-19. We have been discussing this issue for the last three years. You know, every year for the last three years, the finance minister has been saying that we are going to prepare a project for rehabilitating the migrants who will return from the Gulf countries. And uh, we were really expecting that phenomenon. But COVID-19 has aggravated the problem only. And now we are realizing that if I lack uh, uh, Gulf uh, Malayalis, uh, our Malayalis will come from uh, Gulf countries and join the labor force. In this context, definitely we have to address certain problems. One, as raised by some participants, whether our agriculture sector will be benefited. I personally feel that the vegetable cultivation will be benefited largely. And there are a number of Pravasis who started their ventures in vegetable cultivation and they are producing, they have started producing wonderful results also. But it cannot be generalized. But that will be a uh, movement in our state of Kerala in the coming years. That is one aspect. The second important aspect is that uh, the change in the attitude of the people coming from Gulf countries. Yeah, they, they are getting good social status when they are working abroad. Even they are uh, uh, recruited in a low paid jobs or low status job. But when they are here, they are not prepared to do such work here. So we have to have, have good programs to change their social taboo. Uh, in fact, I will say that the dream projects of Kerala should uh, uh, take into account two important aspects. One, the awareness program. Awareness programs are coupled with the counseling to change the mind of the or the attitude of the Pravasis uh, when they join our labor force. That is most, most important things. I think that the dream Kerala will address this issue properly. Uh, Dr. Jinu Sakri, I can uh, take up this, uh, uh, this issue uh, to a higher level. Uh, as as uh, the, the experts said, the migration package and the governance are the two important uh, aspects that will be taken into account by the government. I hope that, but uh, in respect of one major question, the job creation, I have genuine doubts about the job creation, especially in the uh, productive sectors, productive sectors, except the agriculture sector. If you are able to uh, develop the agriculture sector, definitely you can provide employment to a large number of people. But look at the elasticity of employment at all India level, very poor. If it was a 0.6 uh, at one uh, stage, it is now reduced to 0.2 only, less than that, sometimes less than that. So at all India level, you are not able to create a job, even in the midst of the so-called uh, liberalization and other things. So I don't think that even if you have large number of mega projects, a uh, job can be uh, created at all India level. What you are now talking about is not the growth, uh, a jobless growth, but a growth with no job. That is a problem we are now facing at the all India level, I don't think, but Kerala level, state level, if you are able to develop our, uh, develop our agriculture sector, particularly vegetable cultivation, the small enterprises sector, uh, we may be able to provide employment at the all India level also. This is one important area. The government has to consider the small enterprises development. You are talking about MSM, EMS. You are changing. You are trying to change the definition, but I don't think that a real trust is to be done by the government. So in this context, uh, we ha we are going to face a lot of problems in the coming years as far as the return of migrants is concerned, unless they find out suitable destinations elsewhere. This will be a problem for us. With this uh, um, pessimistic out uh, note. I conclude the section. I thank everyone. I invite Nidhiya to uh, express a word of thanks. Thank you, Martin, sir. Uh, 
uh, uh, that was a very insightful session. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Fredlin, and thank you, uh, Janusa. Uh, with that, we would uh, conclude today's webinar. You can uh, share your thoughts and continue the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag CQPR Live Webinars. And thank you all once again for joining us today, and we will see you next.